So yeah, I've been asked uh, multiple times how I got involved with QGIS. Um, I think it's that it's that uh, concept of the the magical unicorn thing. Open source just happens, and then no one quite understands how or, <coughs> or why you would even want to bother doing it, or how someone gets started in it. Um, so my history started as a as a junior GIS officer at council at a local council uh, nearby. Well, not here, obviously, in Brisbane, and. Um, I didn't even know what GIS was. I just saw the job, applied for it because I needed a job. And um, it looked good because it was IT related. So, so I took that job in, in spatial and assets. At the time we used uh, MapInfo. I think this is MapInfo 6, 7. This is not a screenshot from council because we didn't do anything any near, near fancy like that. Uh, we did asset mapping, which was just good old boring lines and polygons and sewer lines and stuff like that. Uh, at, at the time, we, it was perfectly fine. I did a few courses. Did a few courses in Map Basic and stuff like that, and learnt a little bit of programming, and it stumbled upon uh, QGIS 1.4, and surprisingly, this is, is still on the website to download. And this is a live shot from yesterday or the day before that I took a screenshot of and tested, and it seems to work still. And the installer is 28 meg, which is surprising. <laughs> and now it's 300 meg. Um, so yeah, we we used QGIS a little bit, experimented experimented with it as being being a part of being a junior junior officer, I didn't have all the responsibilities of everyone else in the council, so I got to a little, little bit of time to experiment and mess around with things. The problem became that QGIS was good, especially for the forms and the rendering. It was much better than MapInfo in, in that sense, but I couldn't push it into the environment without with missing fe certain missing features. One of those fe features was you couldn't label um, features with expressions like MapInfo could. So you, you used to be able to map info concatenate multiple columns together, add some string on the end, and you could make like sewer type and the sewer diameter millimeters and stuff like that. If you just you couldn't do that, you could only have have the the field, which is that field up there. But for us, we're using tab files, which means you can't do that because you couldn't alter tab files at the time of GDAL, which you can now, but back then you could not. So I couldn't roll it out because we're not going to shift away from tab files to shape files for obvious reasons. And that was pretty much a blocker, like instant, instant blocker. We can't make anywhere near the maps that we could. So I thought we'd just dig in a little bit and see, see how this actually works, knowing that it was open source. I had a C sharp background and a map basic background and a VB background. Um, so it all started from that point of just needing to add something to the, the package to just get it past that little bit extra. So it starts with that selfish need of wanting to do something for myself. Obviously, I didn't really care about the community at that point. There wasn't even a community at that point in the, in the sense that we know it now, like these days. So I, I worked for um, quite a substantial amount of time. I don't know because it's a long time, time ago now. But it would be a solid couple of months every night, just sort of chipping away, plugging in code, just copy and paste to see if it would work, and it ran. And then I just copy and paste a bit more code, and it, would ran, and it worked. Um, at that point, I had no C++ experience. So it was very much a hack and build and then hack and build a bit more and see how we go. Eventually I got to a point and reached out to a developer called Martin, who at the time was living in the Czech Republic. Hopefully that was correct, otherwise he's going to kill me. Um, <laughs> but this is the first email that I went back through Gmail, and a good thing for Gmail, it stores everything forever. Um, so I went back through, through Gmail and, and found my first email to him saying, I, I've, I've developed this something, I've developed a feature, could you take a look at it? And hopefully there's no bad grammar in there because I, st I still suck at um, spelling and grammar. But you can see like just, it was just a reach out to see I've got something that I think I could contribute. It's um, pretty crappy at uh, C++ and I don't really know what I'm doing basically, but I've got something that might work. Um, Mark was quite receptive. This was only a day later. Um, at the time there was only a handful of core developers. And he reached back and said, I'll, I'll review it for you and get, let you know. At the time, they just moved to um, Git from SVN. So originally, I started working when I was in SVN, which just makes it quite difficult to contribute back these types of changes. And the Git move to Git came just before this, which made it quite easier to work and contribute back. So this is also when I used to have lots of free time, and I said I have, I'll have the weekend. I'll have it done by the weekend. <coughs> After a long, substantial email chain, there's about 30 emails back and forth, agreeing, disagreeing about certain things. And uh, we, we pushed through the review. Martin reviewed all the comments, and I applied comments that he had. And then 
landed the commit about a couple of weeks after, after that. So this is the first commit that I made into the project. Um, and if you note the still need some testing and cleanup, because there was no pull request system at that time. It was I, there was a pull request system. There was no review process at that time, so it was merged in, and the code is quite rough. And I didn't know how to write proper headers and uh, didn't indent properly and things like that. So from from that point was the the launch pad of getting involved in the project more and more. It was it was a sim it was a simple fix. It basically hacked in the new expression builder. That the expression builder you see today is basically the 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 evolution of that original expression builder. And from that simple change and that little bit of mentorship, it evolved into being more and more involved. I eventually got commit commit access. Um, Tim, at the time as a chair, like chair of the project, um, nominated me for commit access and I got commit access just, just to work on this only, basically just to implement features and tweak bugs around this individual feature. But that also extends out to sort of features that touch this feature. So places where the dialogue's used and buttons that use it and um, labels that sort of talk about that. So it sort of, it's, it reaches out further. So from that point, it started to, my responsibilities in the project started to grow. Uh, it's like Paul talked about this morning, the feedback loop that happens. You, you basically get more and more involved as, it rapidly, as you rapidly start making changes and you, your responsibility grows out and you become more uh, well known for your changes and that creates that little feedback loop. If, if moving forward, you get more confidence in development, like what your skill level is, um, the, the process, the feedback loop from the other developers, the access to other senior developers. So you can build more and more uh, push, pushing features that are not necessarily uh, as um, simple as the first ones you add. Um, they much, much larger code changes, wider wider sweeping features. So the style doc is um, one of the ones that made it in. I can't remember what version that was added in. Um, and the QGIS function, custom functions, they're quite large features in terms of how much code they touched and how much code they have impacts on. So, but the, the, the hero story that keeps coming up today is, is one thing from this. Every time I bring up that I, that I helped build that style doc or that built that style doc, um, it sounds like a solo effort that I built that by myself. And None of that is possible without all the extra stuff in the system that, that was there originally. So Martin, who I talked to originally, built uh, multi-threaded rendering and multi-threaded labeling. So all that stuff had to happen before I could even get close to building that. Without, without all that infrastructure there, without that system in place, I wouldn't be able to build that. With the expression functions on this side, the custom expression functions, the whole expression engine was rewritten uh, um, by Martin as well. So maybe Martin's the hero. <coughs> um, that was completely rewritten as well to allow that kind of functionality. Without that, I wouldn't have been able to add that. So it's a, it's a collective effort, it's not just a solo effort, and I'm not, don't work in a vacuum. So that's quite a substantial amount of work. A lot of that was in my free time. I did m most of that early work in, um, in my free time without um, s no, almost no work time at all. So that comes back to like, why even, why even do it at all? Um, it's a weird one. I watched something on about motivation the other day and uh, about Mindtree not always being a motivator. I guess that comes back down to sometimes it just feels good to get back stuff. Originally, that, that the selfish need turned into it, other people's needs are good to satisfy. You see people uh, say something on Twitter and you're like, well, I could fix that because I have the power to fix that, whereas they might not have the power to fix that. So that's, that makes me and us as a project uh, better because we like to make other people happy. It helps improve their lives, which improves my life, our lives. So money isn't always a motivator. Obviously, we need money to live, um, well, and eat. Um, so it's not always a motivator. So a lot of the early stuff was done in my free time purely because I had that time. Um, it's also sometimes just because it's an itch or just a bug that annoys, annoys me. Um, the fact that the style doc was born out of one afternoon trying to style a map and constantly hitting a dialogue and having just to close it all the time drove me insane and I couldn't handle it anymore and it just snapped. <laughs> and originally the style doc was just going to be a label doc because that's where I was having the frustrations. So I built the, the label doc and then realised that their style could go in there as well and then undo history could go in there as well and sort of evolved from that. But as, that's come out of a pure frustration. It wasn't because someone said, I want you to build this. It was pure just, 
bug the crap out of me. Sorry, I had to do it. Um, but noting on the free time thing um, and not during work time, there's a privilege that I had at the time, which was I had time to do it. People don't necessarily have time. Not everyone has the time to spend in their free time to work on projects. I spent a substantial amount of time not sleeping, which was probably not a good idea at the time, um, working from working at council and then coming home and then working on open source projects and mostly just QGIS and then sleeping and then repeat. repeat. I was married, but it's, that's okay. It was, an, it was an agreement. We worked in the same room, still. So that's the point is not everyone has that. So the open source community can look kind of privileged when you look at someone's commit graph. If they're quite busy they, and someone's not busy, they may look, they might have the ability to have more time to devote. So some employees look at Git, uh, people's GitHub repositories and say, well, you, you're really good at open source contributions, but they might not know that they have the, the ability to spend that time, whereas other people do not. Um, <coughs> if you have to work at a really hard job that's labor intensive, you don't have that time, you might be burnt out by the time you get home from work, whereas council jobs are quite comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Where I worked, at least it was comfortable. So, so the no kids thing was is asterisks because I, I did have kids, but they were young, so they could sit in the bouncer <laughs> and <laughs> whilst I work, because that's what they're gonna do. Whereas now I cannot do that because they, they get into everything. Um, a stable job is the key point there. I had good income, I didn't have to search for a job. I knew that I could pay for food and rent and everything like that. I didn't have to stress about it. I could just spend all my free time doing everything else. And coding at the time was my hobby. That's all I basically did. And I'll come back to that point in a minute. So that's what that, that's what that um, increase in activity looks like. Basically joined the project in 2011 and then just wrap it up, ramp it up. And that's number of commits. So it's kind of not an indicator of quality because <laughs> 100 of those could be fix bug, fix bug, fix bug, fix typo. Um, but I show half that graph and not the rest of it for a reason because there is pitfalls in, in this type of line of work, in, especially in open source community, especially the give, like the take take type world without giving back. Um, burnout is a, is, is a real thing. Um, there's a point in my life where my daughter died here in 2013 and after that I burn out quite substantially. You will see where it happens in the graph later on, but it's not really where you think it would happen. And then the imposter syndrome is another tricky one because you've got people with some, some serious skill throwing some really good stuff in and then you're like, ah, I just fixed a typo. Um, <laughs> ignoring, of course, that that typo did have substantial impact on someone's life when they read it. There's small tweaks that don't look major, changing icons and updating, making sure the theme looks nice, making sure the GUI looks nice. They don't feel like substantial changes, but they do impact people's workflows and in, in its essence life. Um, oh. So 2013 is when the event happened and this looks like where the burnout should happen, but it's not. The burnout happens here. Um, this is where I basically threw most of my life into that, into the project, because I had nothing else. And that, that caused me to burn out, basically spending all my free time in the project, burn out, and then that's, that's a drop off. Except most of my contributions now are more quality than they are just a bunch of, a ton, a million bug fixes, <laughs> or a million typo fixes. Um, so that brings around a point is that breaks are perfectly okay to have when you're a developer, especially open source. You can just let things go. You will see a constant stream of hate and and demands on Twitter that people want things and you can just ignore it and just say, I don't, give, I don't care, it's not my problem. <laughs> it's perfectly fine to take certain projects on and do them and, and not care about all the other things. You can't fix the world ultimately. And there's always more releases. There's always bug fix releases. You can do the next one. Um, so contributions uh, to the project are probably the biggest talk factor about, it's not necessarily who you, what your background is in the sense of like, you don't have a PhD, we don't care if you got a computer science degree, it doesn't matter. Um, Martin has a computer science degree, I'm pretty sure, and I do not. I don't have any formal training at all, apart from just being a developer, um, a day job. But you don't need that to contribute. If you just want to contribute a bug fix or an icon fix or a theme fix, it's perfectly fine. We don't really mind as long as it comes in. Um, as long as you follow the rules, generally, it's perfectly fine. So that um, the contribution thing sort of goes in hand with encouraging others to contribute and making sure that people can um, contribute by encouraging them to do it. So 
when people do contribute, you don't want to just um, block them out. You try and encourage them to contribute, or if they aren't sure, bring them into the project and sort of show them the ropes, rather than just saying we are the gatekeepers because we're the magic, the uh, magic wizards. Um, because I'm definitely not a wizard, like a, like a beard. <laughs> so we still do it. We still do it. This is probably 20 hours ago now. Um, but this is Martin responding to some work that Niall just did with a little um, party popper. But like it's. It's just that type of thing. Um, we're, we all try, you try to be friendly with everyone and make, make sure you're friendly with everyone else. Because ultimately everyone works hard. Some people, you don't know what people's situations are. Um, the, commit, the code might look like it took a day to write, but it could have taken six months or three months of background work to get to that point, or five, five refactors of the same code over and over again until you get to that nice, clean version. And sometimes that little bit of encouragement is good to push people over the line. And it's especially important with new developers. Um, when you're more, more involved in the project, you need it less because you just, you're used to it, but it still helps to have the encouragement. So that's, that's an important point because I wouldn't be here ultimately as a core developer, as talking at Fossil um, without that uh, encouragement at the, the start. If Martin or Tim or any of those had been toxic and, and gatekept, or um, not encouragement, there's no encouragement, there's no encouragement at all to contribute back, I basically would have walked away. Because I'm sure I could have found something else to do, although I probably wouldn't have, and probably would have done other coding. <laughs> um, um, so that's the thing, don't, don't gatekeep basically, there's no, there's no magic, there's no, no wizards and no, no real heroes, ultimately we're all just human. So um, you can just, you learn the skills as you go basically. Um, there's some code, parts of the code base I won't, I won't touch because it's that's scary stuff. And <laughs> the multi-thread rendering stuff, that's scary. I'm not going to go anywhere near that. But ultimately, I, I can observe it and I can understand, I can understand it. Um, but Martin doesn't gatekeep that. If I want to understand how that works, I can go to him and talk to him. There's parts of the code base that I've written that other people ask me about. And, and it's important to make sure you do not put those gates in there because that's how you kill your project, basically. And there, we've seen that happen in certain projects, in certain communities, that they gatekeep hard and then they die because it's just a little, little group and, and that's it. So closing point is ultimately there's no magic, no wizards. It's all just code and lots of, lots of documentation. Um, you can contribute. Um, ultimately, well, I could grow up from being a non-programmer and be a core developer now and to struggle with C++ because it's C++. Um, but you can do it, basically, ultimately. There's nothing stopping any, anyone else doing it. Um, and if you, if you want to contribute, you basically just have to reach out for help, depending on the community. Some, some, some are harder than others. But it's, it's all possible, ultimately. I think that's it. <laughs>